Hi everyone and welcome to a new series. Uh, this series is around how you can create and deploy your own smart contracts on this new blockchain called the Solana blockchain. So we'll try to understand what are blockchains, what are the different types of blockchains that currently exist, why Solana came into the picture, why it might be better or worse than the existing blockchains and how you can start developing your projects on the Solana blockchain. So with that, let's get right into it. So let's understand what's the purpose of blockchains. This dates back to 2008 when there was a financial crisis. Banks were being seen in a very bad light and a white paper emerged under the anonymous name of Satoshi Nakamoto called the Bitcoin White Paper. The Bitcoin White Paper was the first paper to establish a functioning and trustless concept of money without the need of a centralized authority. This problem is also known as the Byzantine General's problem, which describes the difficulty in arriving at consensus of a problem without relying on a centralized party in a completely decentralized scenario. The big problem to solve here is how can you ensure that people are not spending the same coins twice. In the physical system, our currency nodes are stamped with a number and this ensures that the same amount of money cannot be spent twice. In the digital world, you can try to solve the same problem by maintaining a ledger. The ledger basically represents the ownership of a coin at any point and whenever you're trying to spend it, you'll basically transfer the ownership of that coin to someone else. This is fairly easy to do when there's a centralized authority in the picture and usually the centralized authority is the government. We trust the government not to seize, debase, or change the value of money over time. The Bitcoin white paper describes an algorithm that solves this problem without the need of a centralized authority. Let's try to understand how they do it. The way they solve it is using something called as proof of work. Before we understand that, let's try to understand how you can create a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. On the Bitcoin network, every user has a public-private key pair. This means they have two set of keys, one that they can share with the world and the other one that they need to keep to themselves. The special thing about this key pair is that you can sign a message using your private key and anyone in the network can decode that message using your public key. This is very helpful because if I want to transfer a certain amount of Bitcoin to a friend of mine, I can just write this in a transaction and sign this using my private key. If I send this message over to all the nodes in the network, they can then use my public key to verify that this message actually came from me. Another very powerful thing about this public-private key pair is that it's very difficult to decode a message uh, randomly. For example, if I sign a message and give it to you and you don't know my public key, it'll be very hard for you to decode it. Also, if I change my message slightly, uh, the final hash that comes out after signing it with my private key is significantly different from what it was before. So if you have a signed message from me, you can't really change the signed message a little bit and hope that the actual message inside also changed a little bit. So getting back into how you can transfer money, let's say I own 10 Bitcoin and I want to transfer one Bitcoin to a friend. Uh, I will just sign a message that says, hey, this one Bitcoin I need to transfer from myself to this other public address. And I'll sign it using my private key and I'll broadcast this message to every node that exists on the Bitcoin network. Hopefully a few of the nodes will pick it up and they'll try to batch all of these transactions because I'm not the only one who's making a transaction at this time. They'll receive all of these messages from a bunch of folks. They'll try to batch these together into something known as a block. And then once they have a significant chunk of transactions to batch together and clear it a block, each of them will start to do some sort of work. Now this concept is slightly important and this is why this algorithm is known as proof of work. Let's say they've bashed together 20 transactions, which all represent people transferring money from point A to point B. Once they've bashed these 20, they need to find a string also known as the nonce. And the special thing about this string should be that when they join all of these messages and the string at the end, the final hash that they generate after signing all of these should start with a certain number of zeros. And this quantity keeps on changing uh, based on how difficult you want to make to mine a Bitcoin. But essentially, this is what mining is. Um, a computer working a lot in order to find a nonce that when combined with all the transactions in that block and hashed ha starts with a certain number of zeros. This is a very hard problem to solve and this is why people say if you have a very simple laptop you might not be able to mine very effectively on Bitcoin because as time goes by and as machines keep on getting stronger and stronger the number of zeros that you need in the beginning of the final hash keep on increasing so as to make this problem more complicated to solve. The first machine that is able to do that broadcasts this new block that it has created and found the nouns for to everyone else in the network and everyone else in the network accepts that and the node that did find it first is given a certain reward in terms of bitcoins. And as time keeps going by, more and more such blocks are added to the very long thing which is now known as the blockchain because there are a lot of blocks joined one after the other. Now let's try to understand why this is called a blockchain. 
The reason for this is, let's say you want to change the Bitcoin database, as in you're an attacker who wants to modify a transaction that happened a day ago, uh, where you sent your friend to Bitcoin, you just want to reverse that transaction for some reason. What you'll have to do is you'll have to go back in time to that block that you want to modify. You'll have to modify that transaction in that block. You'll have to find the nonce for it, and then you'll have to resubmit it to the blockchain to all of the nodes. This might be easy, even though this is very difficult in itself. But the more tricky bit is there are a lot of blocks that have been added after that. And there's one thing I did not tell you up until this point. When you're finding the nonce, you're finding the hash of the transaction in this block, plus the nonce, plus the hash of the block that came before this. All three of these when hashed together should start with a certain number of zeros. So the nonce of a block actually depends on the hash of the block that came before it. So if an attacker wants to go back in history and modify a block, they'll actually have to find the nonce for every block that comes after it because none of them are valid anymore. And the Bitcoin paper states, if at any point there are multiple forks in the network, the longest chain is what is considered as valid. So in order to modify an existing block, the attacker will have to find the nonce for that block and all the blocks that come after it in order to compete with the currently longest blockchain. In more technical terms, an attack on the Bitcoin chain is possible only if the attacker owns more than 50% of the compute on the whole network. And that is something that's really hard to do, uh, considering there are so many miners all across the world. So that's how the Bitcoin network aims to secure itself. There are a bunch of other nuances here that I'm not getting into the details of, but there's a link in the description to the Bitcoin white paper. You can go through that if you want to understand this in a bit more detail. So Bitcoin was the first protocol to solve the Byzantine problem for money, and it's still very popular today. It's considered as a great store of value for your money. But let's try to understand a few downsides of this. As you saw, each of the machines after creating a block are actually competing against each other to find the nonce. That means if you have five miners in a network, they're all basically trying to solve the same problem. Now, this is necessary if you want to secure the Bitcoin blockchain because that's how it works. And the reason it cannot be hacked is because it's very difficult to do that work all over again for an attacker. But the downside is this gets really slow. You have so much compute at your disposal and all you're using it for is to solve a random problem in the process, competing with your peers. This actually leads to a lot of uh, unnecessary expense uh, when it comes to electricity, which causes uh, environmental impact and so on. And hence, it is slightly criticized. And to try to fix that, there are a few other algorithms that have come into the picture. One of them is called proof of stake, which is something Ethereum is aiming to move to uh, in 2022. And if they do, the transactions that they can process in a second will go up by a lot. The reason being that these machines will no longer be uh, competing against each other but there'll be a different way to secure the network by using something called as staking. We'll not go too deep into what that is, but the basic idea is if you want to become a miner on a proof of stake blockchain, what you do is you stake a certain amount of coins of that blockchain. For example, if you're on Ethereum, you'll stake, let's say 50 Ethereum. And that is how the network is secured. Any miner, if they try to do any sort of a fraudulent activity, the Ethereum that they've staked gets slashed and hence they are incentivized to not perform attacks. Also, you no longer need a lot of compute because you're no longer solving that difficult problem. The more amount of Ethereum that you have staked, the higher the probability that you'll be chosen as the block leader. And hence, someone with a very small machine can also mine at the same capacity as someone with a very big machine, as long as they've staked the same amount of Ethereum. So that was a lot for one video. Uh, I hope you have a brief understanding of what Bitcoin is, why it was introduced, what is Ethereum, and what problem it tries to solve with introducing proof of stake over proof of work. In the next video, let's try to understand a new consensus algorithm. It tries to solve some of the shortcomings of the Bitcoin network. And in the next video, let's try to understand how exactly they do it.